Welcome back to class. This lecture is going to be talking about lead. Maybe we should start off with, don't ever call it leads with an S on the end. It's not L-E-E-D is the acronym. Anybody that says leads, it seems like they're not taken seriously. They're always saying leads this or leads that. And uh, <laughs> I'll pretend like they know what they're saying and and convince a lot of people until they start using the S at the end of the the D and then people are like, oh yeah, it's, they don't know. So uh, if you want to BS your way through lead, don't put an S on the end. And uh, But uh, there's a lot to it. It's uh, grown quite a bit yeah, since uh, its early days and we'll look at Wikipedia a little bit, uh, look at some of the documents and uh, so, some of the differences for between what the designers need to do versus the contractors. And this won't be an extensive deep dive into lead. Um, some of the textbooks I have um, are, they're not that old, but they still don't have the current information. So, and, and lead doesn't necessarily publish their stuff for free. You have to buy their manual and stuff. So I'm just going to try and stay surface level and discuss uh, a little bit about it from my perspective um, and, and share what I understand it to be. So back in, I think, 2007, the company I worked for at the time was had done several LEED certified buildings and, and they were looking for more LEED accredited professionals. So I just used what I hope to be the correct terms uh, the, the certification goes towards the building and the accreditation goes towards the individual. So uh, at the time, I don't remember what version it was, maybe two point something. And, uh, and so I had the opportunity, along with many of my associates, to go test into become a lead accredited professional. And that was before there was anything like B, D, and C or operation and maintenance and homes. I can't remember what the ID is, uh, interior design and construction. And I think this is neighborhood development. These things didn't exist at the time. It was just one rating system, I think, at the time. And so uh, it was a pretty good long test, had a lot of studying, and a whole bunch of us uh, got done with that. My favorite story is a project manager who went through all the testing he still called it leads at, at the end. I don't know why that's such a sticking point for somebody, but for some reason in the industry to say leads is you know, like uh, nails on a chalkboard for some reason. <laughs> he learned that it was. He purposefully would say leads all the time just to, uh, just to get underneath people's skin, even though he knew better. And he would always go like, I'm a leads certified, uh, I'm LEED certified, even though the buildings are get the certification and uh, we're going to accredit this building. And he always like switched the language around. It's pretty entertaining to watch, um, <laughs> to watch him purposely mess up the language so that uh, he'd get under people's skin. Anyway, pretty funny, but uh, hopefully that was a funny story. Anyways, let's get into LEED. So let's look at uh, Wikipedia. LEED is Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Some of the early, uh, early classes that I took had a discussion where they were saying that uh, the E and the E, the energy and environmental design. So the the energy. This is just what was taught to me. I don't know if it's really true. So, uh, but it uh, it seems purposeful. So I'll repeat it. They said that it was uh, on the E and the energy was before environmental. So the environmental design is more towards the impact on the environment and the indoor environment, uh, meaning uh, Mother Nature and then the human beings in, uh, environment inside. And the energy became energy uh, design was before environmental design, meaning that uh, energy uh, savings and energy uh, stewardship was was uh, more of a priority than creating 
environmental space. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they were told telling me. And the people that were teaching the class were uh, part of the USGBC uh, mm -hmm. folks. So I believe them there. And so the USGBC, US Green Building Council, that's who uh, we could uh, click on this. But it uh, supposedly founded in 1993. I don't know all the specifics. Other than that USGBC uh, is the governing council on uh, the lead rating system. And so there's a whole bunch of different, a uh, little bit of history here. I don't, you can read that if you want. Um, so the re lead rating system now has, uh, this is 2009. Let's see. We're on version four, I thought. Okay, so there's four point something, I'm sure. Uh, so the B, D, and C is usually what I'm most familiar with. So building design and construction. And if we go back to there, B, D, and C, B, D plus C, lead for building design and construction. So that's dealing with new construction, uh, corn shell schools retail healthcare and there's these different segments that um, the rating system tries to specifically target to give you uh, some criteria both in design and construction specific to these to be able to acquire certain points so it's a rating system and if you're doing a, a new construction or a corn shell um, we would try it the number of points that you're trying to hit uh, are based off of both design factors and and constructability things and materials that are picked and uh, other things I'll get into in more in more detail here in a second. But then you get these uh, up to a certain point and if you get to, let's see if they have it here. I don't know. Let's see if they have it here where you have lead certified buildings I don't see the rating system but I believe certified is the lowest certification that it can use so if you got to a certain threshold of points uh, you could be certified and then the next level of certified is gold and then or silver and then the next one's gold and then the next one's platinum and i don't remember what if there's more on top of that there probably is i just remember uh certified silver gold platinum and so when we look at uh like a certain points threshold when you do a new construction um versus like a, just a core and shell so you say, say you had a brand new office building and the old the whole thing was built out on the inside versus just a core and shell so there'll be probably different points meaning in a core and shell you wouldn't have a ton of interior lighting figured out uh core and shell is just the exterior of the building and then the the meaning the shell is the exterior and the core is like the stairs, the elevator tower, the structure, that kind of stuff. So there's not, it's not really built out on the inside. And so the point systems and the thresholds to be able to hit different points would be different between a new building where you're trying to go from ground up to finished product to just stopping at the corn shell being complete. And then obviously schools would be different than retail and healthcare and all kinds of different uh so they'd have a different rating system or how many points that you need to be uh met for each of these and what categories in the rating system would make sense in these kind of environments and which ones don't so they segment them out when when i was first involved in in uh, lead projects the they did not have this difference and so it was pretty it was a challenging thing to to try and hit all the enough points to be able to get the certification that we were going for when we were doing a segment of construction that didn't make sense for it and so it can be a challenge um oh here we are hey 
certification level certified silver gold platinum and uh, so this is a good a good little I don't know if this is what the point systems are on every single one uh, I don't know if if new construction has 40 to 49 it's it's been too long since I've worked on one probably probably four years since I've worked on a on a lead project so I don't I don't remember a whole lot uh, whether B D and C with new construction versus core and shell had a completely different numbering system but right here according to Wikipedia it has it here okay and then uh, let's just run through sort of the other ones that they have let's go back to their website so they got uh, B D and C They've got lead for op building operations and maintenance. So this is uh, you have an existing building, and you get uh, a, you can certify the building somehow with their uh, with leads rating system based off of uh, some criteria associated with operation maintenance, uh, and then interior design. And so the let's see, I've never done this one. Enables project teams who may not have control over the whole building operations to develop indoor spaces that are better for the planet and for people. All right, cool. So you can get a IDNC uh, certification as well. Something for homes. There's a rating system for homes and a neighborhood development stuff as well. Let's look back at here and see if I need any okay 2009 2014 version 4 okay I already said that lead certification is granted by the building uh, US GBC so Green Building Council uh, but I guess it's called GBCI now and so the uh, help it down here it says US GBC whatever a um, bunch of stuff on Wikipedia about whether it's actually good or not energy performance I was reading through this whether people think that uh, this lead actually creates better energy or better interior into uh, interior uh, environmental uh, interior environment see if it's, if it's better than, oh God, sorry been a long week again um got some uh wikipedia had some some things here benefits uh so one of these was whether it costs more to do uh, a lead certified building or not and so the, i think the the main advantages are obviously that it's more energy efficient more environmentally friendly uh, both from a design and uh, standpoint and from a functional standpoint and uh, again from like mother nature standpoint and like the uh, the people in the building feel like it's more energy efficient or a better place to work or a better place to live and so is that all true I don't know I'm not the one to judge but uh, but I know that it typically costs more and so uh, upfront costs typically are more to try and do a lead building. The it, it does take a team uh, focused on on lead from the very beginning to the very end and even after. So there's there's a fair amount of cost just from the management standpoint, design standpoint, focused on it. Is it a huge cost relative to the building cost? Probably not, but it is. A cost so I mean all things being equal just the amount of management time would say that it costs more money but uh, so yes it costs more in my opinion there is like this idea that incentive programs are there and at one point in time the federal projects that I was working on uh, they all mandated that it was all of them were mandated at the time to be lead silver or better and uh, so we had to go through 
the lead uh, lead uh, certification for the building and getting all the points and stuff. So uh, and sending it off for review and dealing with all that fun stuff. Yeah, not a bad article here on Wikipedia about it. I thought it was okay. Uh, you want to know more about lead? I don't. I don't mind uh, recommending this part right here. There is a lot to it. There's uh, anyway. It, this could be when we did the, when I did the testing. It was probably as much as uh, I don't know to become a lead accredited professional at the time. I think I was in like three weeks of two back-to-back, -back, two days back-to-back -back, um, learning about this stuff and in class and then doing a bunch of studying and then taking a test. It was pretty extensive um, at the time. I remember it being pretty hard. I did pass, just woohoo, but a lot of folks didn't. And it, and I don't blame them. It was a dang challenge to do that. And if you're working on a project and you're busy trying to do all that too, hmm, that would be hard. All right. Um, let's look at this graphic here. So this is version four of BD and C. So, uh, building design and construction. And what we're looking at is, uh, the project checklist here. So, um, so these are the categories right here. You have the location and transportation and um, and it looks like to me, it's been a while, this is the possible points you can get. And sometimes, uh, so let's just go, so lead for neighborhood development, location, there's 16 possible points to get. And again, okay, so here we are, certified as 40 to 49 silver is 50 to 59 gold is 60 to 79 and you try and uh during um i think like one of these is i forget how the checklist actually works but i think like your intention is to go after it here on the green and then uh your best guess as to what you are going to get and then uh i thought that this is the, like the one where this is the actual points. I don't know. I could be wrong on, on, uh, this is, like I said, it's been like four years since I've looked at this, but, uh, we could look at this. So there, the location is a big deal in this, uh, in this particular segment and in the, the lead checklist here, sensitive land protection, high priority site surrounding density and diverse uses you have the five points there and then bicycle facilities reduced parking per footprint green vehicles uh, let's just look at uh, before we get into all this um hold on my daughter's asking me if you, i want dinner okay maybe i should stay with the high level and then we'll dive into this what what you'd see so location and transportation meaning the location of the building and then the transportation is like how close the building is to different public transportation and other things like that. Green sustainable transportation. Then uh, how, how sustainable is the site? Are we doing anything with water efficiency? How are we maintaining like, uh, anyway, we'll read through some of these energy atmospheres. So you're dealing with uh, the actual building, uh, energy and and uh power and where the are you doing with renewable energies how, how are we doing dealing with uh hvac system um that kind of stuff materials and resources so like uh so you can read some of these words like uh demolition waste management recycling um some of it is how close to the uh to the actual location is that all the materials so source how, where your source of the materials is coming from um, recycled content all kinds of stuff like that and uh, the indoor environmental quality so some of this has to do with uh, um, I don't remember environmental tobacco smoke control I don't remember what that is but 
Uh, these ones you don't get to not choose. You have to choose these. Like you have some that are pre pre uh, prerequisites that you have to do. Do you see those? Like, yes, you absolutely have to do these. These are prerequisites. And then you get to choose which one you're going to work on uh, among the rest of these to try and get to the points that you want for the the different certifications that they have. And uh, so the materials and resources part of this is like I was saying was how far away the, the source material is. Uh, and then uh, the environmental quality and dealing with lighting and uh, they have low emitting materials. So like the adhesives and glues and carpet, so even like little things that you have to, you have to really pay attention to on uh, the, the materials that you're using on the site so that they don't uh, off gas. And uh, so then you got, what do you think might be in thermal comfort? I guarantee number or accessibility of ther thermostats is probably there. Daylight views, uh, qual quality views, acoustical performance. And then you have this innovation that you can go after. So you can come up with some something that says, well, it wasn't in your list over here on any of these lists, but we did this really cool thing to try and be energy efficient or environmentally friendly and and uh, then you can say, well, I think that's worth so many credits and and you, the the reviewers for from USGBC will uh, either agree with you and then award you some credits or not. not. And uh, looks like you get a point for having a lead a credit professional on the team and then uh, regional priority. I don't know what those are. I can't think of what they are. But let's go look at. Um, Maybe I'll just print this to PDF so we can look at it here. Sorry, that was dumb to do this during the lecture, but we'll do that anyway. And I'm probably not going to... Um, I'm probably not even going to edit this out of the lecture. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's get. Probably you're sitting there on YouTube t -t 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 really fast. And I highly recommend you do that right now. But that's okay. Oh, wrong way. Now I've got the scorecard over here, uh, project checklist, sorry, whatever. Um, and let's just look at sustainable sites and this document that I have. So uh, we have rainwater management and you have three possible points that you can get for it. And then as you look at this rainwater management, uh, the intent is to reduce runoff volume and improve water quality by replicating the natural hydrology and water balance of the site based on historical conditions and undeveloped ecosystems in the region. So what the crap are they talking about? Well, all they're saying is, what would the water do in a rainfall event um, or snow event if there was no building there? Well, most of it would seep into the ground. And so the, the idea here, a lot of it is to, there we go, path number one is that in a manner best replicating natural hydrology processes, manage site, manage on-site runoff from the development, from the developed site for the 95th percentile of regional or local rainfall events using low impact development and green infrastructure. So what might, might, might put the, well, let me just give you an example like uh, using the water to falling on a roof to be a, to like collect and then uh, be using it to water the plants. That would probably land somewhere in one of these points right here or using um, pervious pavement. Did I say that right? Permeable? Permeable pavement? Pervious? I don't know. I can't remember what the crap it's called right now. Heat it in these lectures, but I don't remember what it is that's called. But uh, like concrete that's permeable and lets water go through. I think it's called pervious pavement. 
Now I feel terrible. I have to look it up. Permeable pavement. I typed in pervious pavement, but oh, it is the word. Okay, allows rainwater and other sources to percolate into the base layer. Oh, hey, perfect examples right here, right? So that's all concrete, but it's it's a. Uh, let's see if this guy has a. Check that out. There's a uh, some permeable pavement. There's a good example of it right there. That's not going to be permeable that is permeable a lot of the fines come out pretty cool you can see every time you go up to uh, uh i know where this like they they use it frequently but uh meaning it's it's not uh it's not uncommon to find it but up if you go to the museum of natural history here in salt lake their parking lot is like this and it allows water to get through rather than <clears throat> rather than collect and get into the storm drain any rain or runoff uh, from snow that's all collected and going into the ground uh, into the groundwater and so like what are the benefits of that the idea here is well say you have a parking lot and uh, you're not putting um, runoff from a, r a parking lot into the storm drain which eventually goes into a creek or a river or a lake and so the environment is benefited by the the building itself not uh not having a rainfall event carry pollutants into the the storm drain system <clears throat> um so here we have the heat island effect, heat island reduction. And so you could make uh, a lot of your roof not actually reflective. And uh, anyway, you could do vegetated roof. You could uh, all kinds of things here to make it so that uh, uh, the roof is not, uh, is not creating a heat island. And so the no, you could also do parking. So parking lots also are considered a heat island. to minimize the effects of microclimates and humans and wildlife habitats on, by reducing heat islands. So the idea here, like you ever walk through like a parking lot, asphalt parking lot, and it's super hot. And you walk through like the grassy area and it's not so hot. That's the idea behind a heat island. So the do something to be able to minimize that heat light and effect on your roof and the same thing in your parking and you can get some points. Light pollution has a lot to do with like up lighting and how uh, are you leaving light on, how much light you have on, that kind of stuff. And so you kind of read through the sustainable site and we get into all these little things that you can do from both the design. This is all design stuff really at this point in time. The designers are going to have to put it in the design and uh, then we build it. So let me see if I can go find some with the where the general contractor is responsible for it. And that might be what the yellow and the orange was. Who's the is it the designer or the contractor? I can't remember. Okay, this is all going to be design whether they're doing how the designers are gonna to have to design all that stuff okay here we go fundamental commissioning and verification and this will lead into our next uh, topic but all it is is that we're gonna have a, a, a commissioning team go through a commissioning process and in the le next lecture I'll be talking about that <clears throat> So that would not be the design team. That's a commissioning team on the site. No, nope, none of those that I can see. Storage and collection of recyclables. Absolutely, that's going to be the general contractor. So let's let's go try and find that right there. Materials and resources. It's the first prerequisite. 
Okay. So the intent of it is to reduce the waste that is generated by building occupants and hauled to and disposed of in landfills. Do you follow? So what that hopefully made sense. Basically, you're trying to recycle as much stuff during construction and not send things to the landfill. Um, so let's see. Hopefully you can read a little bit of that. Um, bunch of stuff you have to do anyway, just to basically not sending as, I don't remember what percentage can go to the landfill. Um, but I thought it was like 95% of it had to not. Hmm. Anyway, maybe it's not that high. Maybe it's only like 50%. Maybe I'm just, I mean, we can, you can do this. I mean, I think this is a worthwhile thing doing on any job is set up. If you have enough uh, logistical space to set up uh, different uh, recycling containers rather than just a straight dumpster that's going to the landfill. And I don't think it costs that much more. And it's a good, uh, a good thing to be doing. Um, you have to go on a, on a non lead building, go to the point of trying to track it all. Maybe not, but, um, but in the description of this thing, when, when you have, you have to actually track, uh, how much waste is being recycled and you have to like get the, uh, the sh I don't know how you can do it. You can do it by volume or weight when I was involved in it, but I don't know if that's still true. Probably is. Um, and so you'd have to collect the, uh, do a calculation from the, the dumpster company on have them collect all the, uh, the weights on, on both the recycled containers and, <clears throat> and, the, and the stuff that went to the, uh, the landfill and um anyway one of the one of the things that got tough on some of them is uh when you have to do demolition um so that's another one right here reduce construction demolition uh waste disposed of in landfills so <clears throat> concrete is super dense very heavy and doing concrete demolition if you can find a way to uh, recycle that. Uh, say you had to demo a bunch of like concrete paving or something as far as part of the project. Trying to recycle that into um, road base. That we did we did that on a project and that was really really successful. And large large uh, areas of concrete were recycled into road base. And when we when we were able to do that, the um, the percentages were super high by by weight um, because we had so much concrete being recycled but if we didn't have a way to recycle the concrete we would have been hosed on this prerequisite we wouldn't have been able to do it uh, because it's a prerequisite meaning that if you don't do it you don't get the the, the, the <clears throat> any points uh, you can't you have to do these or you don't get the you don't get certified or you don't get the building certified you have to do it um, you got, uh, let me see some more. The IEQ, the low emitting materials, that would be a lot of it are both in the specifications, but <clears throat> in the, during the submittal process, the contractor has to collect a lot of information for uh, the products being used on the site and make sure that they have uh, low E materials, uh, low E stuff in it. And, uh, and then this is another one, the construction indoor air quality management plan. That's the contractor having to do that. Let's see if we can find that one here. See if we can give a description. Okay, 
promote the well-being of construction workers and building occupants by minimizing indoor air quality problems associated with construction renovation. Um, so SMACNA, it, SMACNA indoor air quality guideline is what your plan has to be based off of. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, well, they got it right here. Uh, do not operate permanently installed air handling equipment during construction unless filtration meeting with a MERV 8 uh, or higher filter is in there and then you have to change out the filters. Um, protect stored on-site uh, anything that's going to absorb uh, water. You have to protect it from not absorbing water. You got the VOC. Um, Outdoor emissions, let's see. Manage fumes and avoid infiltration. Tobacco, prohibit the use of tobacco products in the building. Noise and vibration, develop a plan to reduce noise and emissions of vibration, construction, and infection control. Um, <clears throat> so the, the one that I do remember, like specifically from SMACNA, and, and some of these things right here that they're talking about is, the ductwork itself has to be protected from getting dust in it. So anytime you see ductwork with plastic over the face of it, that's what they were trying to do is to keep dust out of the ductwork so that when they start running it, uh, all that construction dust isn't going back into uh, the occupant space. Indoor air quality assessment. So you can do flush out before occupancy, during flush, uh, occupancy, basically to try and get uh, <coughs> get rid of any VOCs that are left or any construction dust or anything like that. At the anyway, there's so what the point of that was was so that uh, you understand that some of this is really about the design. The designers are going to have to design this stuff into their building. The owner is going to have to dis decide to pay for it or uh, <clears throat> sign off on that design and say, "Yeah, we're going to we're going to deal with uh, the ramifications of having a permeable concrete, and we're going to go deal with that, or we're going to deal with have a a way of dealing with a green roof on our building." Uh, so all all owner stuff, design stuff, the contractor just has to build it. Uh, there's not a lot on the point system for the contractor to do on those or on some of these other ones it's all about the contractor trying to track how much is recycled uh, the low emitting materials the vocs the how far away the materials are coming from let me see if i can find that one real quick i think that's worthwhile uh, material sourcing of raw materials i bet that's what it is I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where it is. Oh, well, that's enough, I think. From uh, some lessons learned on, uh, on lead stuff from a general contractor standpoint, it's a lot easier to do uh, the to do this incrementally over time rather than try and like slam it all together at the end of the project. Um, so the had a project where the project engineer 
<clears throat> was supposed to be collecting data for the lead manual at the end of the job and making sure that uh, we were, he was tracking all the uh, recycling and doing these reports for the um, indoor air quality construction indoor air quality management plan and and uh, so after a while when we did an internal audit amongst our own team um, realized uh, yeah he had nothing and so I uh, just wasn't doing it and so that's a error on my part for not getting into trying to micromanage I guess try not to do that in my my career but probably should have micromanaged more at that point in time and then trying to catch up <clears throat> with all that data uh, uh, three quarters of the way through the project um, that, was, that was a real challenge so I would highly recommend uh, filling out uh, doing doing imp this incrementally over time rather than uh, trying to wait until the end of the project to do it and and that takes resources it takes uh, somebody dedicated to it for sure so the it's it, it's more than just uh, ha it's having a team involved uh, that can do it people that are bought in both the superintendent PM the project administration and project uh, engineering uh, roles to to be able to help manage all the flow of information so there's a lot a lot going on <laughs> there, there can be a lot going on and, and it needs to uh, be well well organized so I think that that's enough there for uh, lead I do have do I have ashray here oh no that's going to be a commissioning discussion here so we'll call it good there and we'll pick it up in the next lecture thanks